Okay, um, we're going to get underway. I want to thank Isaac of Native Earth for letting us know that there is a packed session going on simultaneously. And that some of the individuals with PACT may be migrating over here at around two-ish. Um, they certainly can join at that time. And, um, and others obviously can as well. Um, my name is Charles Smith, and I'm the um, Executive Director of Cultural Pluralism Arts Movement Ontario. And we're really uh, happy to um, provide this uh, platform um, through Zoom to connect us around um, digital um, uses in the arts, particularly for Indigenous, Black, people of color, and uh, deaf, disabled, other marginalized artists and their communities, and those who want to um, engage with them in solidarity, collaboration, and um, allyship. I want to start with a, uh, before going into the agenda, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, and, um, and then we'll kind of, I'll open up the, um, I'll give an overview of the sort of agenda and the process that we'll have for today. I know there are a number of people who are on this who are not from Toronto. Um, we have folks from BC um, and the folks there that they would want to uh, acknowledge might be the Coast Salish, the Haida um, and others. Um, there could be folks on here from um, the Midwest who might want to acknowledge the Blackfoot from the East who might want to acknowledge the Mi'kmaq. Um, we're here in Toronto and so it really is important for us to um, uh, discuss the caretakers of this land um, as far back as uh, human memory can go. And um, that is the Haudenosaunee, um, the Huron-Wendat, the uh, Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, and um, the particular spot of Tai Toronto, Toronto uh, as being described as the dish with one spoon which is what the value we want to kind of emulate through this conversation today is that there are resources in the area um, that ideally we should all be able to share in. Um, and that means, on one hand, those who have resources um, need the generosity to be able to share them. And those who um, need resources um, need to have the um, interest in asking. Uh, and then together, that those things have worked out equitably. Um, and we can define that at some later venture. But certainly it's not a matter of people just coming together, it's recognizing where we're at in the spectrum. So I wanted to begin with that um, because clearly the work that we've been doing with Sapamo and others who are here as panelists, and certainly others who are probably online now, have been doing some work in the area of digital um, technology and the arts. And um, true to our mandate um, since beginning, we've always felt collaboration gets us further than anything else. Um, that we go along together as a team um, and that we're able to share and learn from each other, uh, which opens up more opportunities for sharing and growing as we proceed. So that's what we're bringing to you this afternoon is a um, session that has a variety of, of, of people, organizations, that have been looking at the issues of digital technology in the arts. Um, they've certainly helped inform the report that you have that has been authored by um, Kelly Lynn Ashton and Perry Volgari um, for Sapamo. And you'll see references in that report to some of the work that others are doing. Um, and um, we want to just have a conversation about what are the various uses, opportunities, uh, benefits, challenges, uh, because with Sopramo, our goal is to see how we might, in the coming months and years, provide some type of platform for Indigenous, Black, people of color, um, other marginalized artists uh, and allies, solidarity people, to join together. It doesn't mean that we'd be the only thing out there that would be um, uh, hypocritical to our, our mandate. Um, it does mean that we might, you know, work with others around how do we continue to share, how do we educate the field, how do we help organizations build capacities, and particularly um, with our mandate, how do we then ensure that that happens with um, the arts organizations, the artists, 
uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's our uh, hope for today. And um, as you know, we have a number of other sessions coming up, so you probably have seen that in the promo for this one. Uh, you're welcome to attend. For this afternoon, we have five presentations. Um, first one will be by uh, Kelly Lynn Ashton and Perry Volgari, which will really go over the Sapamo report. Um, the second one will be by Jessa Gilo, Bart's Pond. Um, and again, you know, she'd be going over the work that she's doing, um, its importance, and as well. The third is um, Valerie Singh Turner and Anju Singh uh, with their work around culture brew. Um, and they would be then followed by Sean Lee and Victoria, um, his colleague, Warner, um, the work that's coming out of Tangled Arts. And then we'll end with um, Chris Sonneman and Amy Mashinsky, National Ballet, Canadian Opera Company, the kind of digital work that they've been doing in collaboration uh, and their hopes for how to expand that net uh, in the future. The process is this. Each of these will speak as teams, where there are teams, uh, and I think most of them other than Jessa are, perform are presenting in teams. They will present for about 10 minutes. Um, you then, if you have questions or comments, use the chat function. Perry is moderating the chat function. So any particular questions you would have for any particular speaker, ask them and right after each speaker, we'll have some time for the speaker to be able to respond to those questions. So Perry will come on at the end of each speaker, basically saying, here are some of the questions or comments that we've heard and throw it to the speakers. We also encourage the speakers if they wish to ask questions of each other. Um, so it becomes a full conversation. We, we really believe in the notion of collective intelligence um, and that even sometimes while we might have experts on the panel, they may be curious about what the others are doing and want to dig down a bit more. But the priority would be to hear from you, uh, those who have joined this session, uh, hoping to learn some more or to contribute something to the conversation. Um, so again, uh, we'll have our speakers in the order I mentioned. After each speaker, we'll have about um, you know, 10 minutes or so for uh, conversation based on the chat room questions and comments. And then we'll move on to the other speaker uh, after that. Um, you should also know the session is being uh, recorded um, for video replay on our website, Sapama's website. In that regard, uh, those of you who do have questions or comments, we will simply, or Perry will simply read your question or comment, will not uh, introduce your name. Um, just so that, um, you know, we've not asked all of you for permission, because we didn't know who all was coming until today. Um, and we certainly don't want to, um, you know, uh, violate anyone's sense of privacy uh, by putting a name out there where that may not be your wish. Um, so um, I think I've said enough about ground rules and um, the speaking order. And um, unless we're seeing something immediately on the chat box, there are knives at the table, as you've noticed, with the dish with one spoon. There are no knives at the table with the dish with one spoon. Uh, it's a spoon. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> oh. No knives at the table. Okay, um, so can we begin? And uh, Kelly Lynn, I'll turn it over to you, you and Perry. So overview of uh, what this research was. Uh, so the whole point was to see how, what the current research was out there on the digital use by arts organizations um, and to see what people wanted to, so the first component was researching reports that were out there to see what is uh, the third party research on the use by arts organizations of digital tools, and then interviewing select representatives, then running focus groups, first to get an idea of people's knowledge and then drilling down to find out what specifically they were looking for in um, any, any kind of common platform. And the, the whole 
goal of this was to collect, to see how can we collaborate to move organizations and specific artists forward. Um, next. So during the research phase, there were a number of really useful research reports that I was able to find, um, including one from Nordicity that was used by Canada Council to, be, to create the digital strategy fund in the first place. There was also some good ones in the, U, the US and in the UK where they have a similar uh, digital strategy fund, which was in operation before Canada Council's. So there's a lot that can be learned from what they, what they funded, what didn't work, which is most of the projects that they funded. And from those research reports, I then looked at a number of the, um, the, or the specific organizations that they referenced, the investments made by uh, the UK fund to see what other sorts of things were being done, what worked, what can we learn from the mistakes and what can we learn from the few successes that we've seen out there. Uh, for example, um, of, a, of a, some of the mistakes, the Royal Opera House received in the UK received money to build an app. Through that process, they learned that their audience wasn't interested in downloading a specific app. What they wanted was mobile access to the existing content on the Royal Opera House's website. So a lot of money went into developing an app when the audience wasn't actually interested. Another one that, was, that, is, uh, that is a useful example is a project called Culture Juice, which was a collaboration between different performing arts venues. And the idea was that they would have a, develop a common ticketing platform and then be able to promote their different performances to their respective audiences. This, the, the problem with that is that each one of those venues already had their own ticketing um, platform that they already had existing relationships with. The four of them wouldn't work together. Neither, none of them want, were interested in trying to develop their own and the project just died. So these are examples of not actually looking into what you're trying to accomplish before running off to try to develop um, a solution to a problem. There were some really good examples, though, of, of successes. One of them is a website called HowlRound. And it's a website for live theater, which is funded and operated by Emerson College in the US. It has video archives, articles, a map-based listing for theater performances, and a lot of other things, all related to local theater. Then the, one of the ways that that is actually can be run is that it is funded by the college and it, it's part of the curriculum to have students working on it. So it solves its funding uh, problems that way. Another uh, good example was Miracle Theatre in the UK, which is a small regional theatre that developed guidelines through the, the Digital uh, Strategy Fund for digital capture of live performances. And they published those guidelines um, publicly for anybody to use, and they've been implementing them with their own content. But anyone interested in live capture of live perform or digital capture of live performance can access these guidelines. So there's there are some good examples out there that we can learn from. One of the um, the, the uh, conclusions, though, from the research is that there's very good adoption of digital tools for websites and social media. Performing arts organizations, they almost all have websites and use social media. But other digital tools, for example, some of the things I've cited, like capture of live performance, is, is low. And the biggest uh, barriers to that is skill, knowing how to do this, and funding. And I don't think that's going to be news to anybody that's on this um, session. And this is something that 
in all in the research and all of our conversations, it came up, we came, kept coming back with the same things. We, the, there isn't the knowledge of how to take advantage of the tools that are out there. Don't even know what tools are out there and how do you get the, the money and the staff time to be able to use them. So the, one of the conclusions of the research was that small arts organizations, the only way they're going to be able to accomplish um, greater use of digital tools is to collaborate and maximize funding. Through this process, one of the other things we learned is that Canada Council is not organizing its funding. So there are several organizations that have been funded that are working on the same or similar types of projects. And this is one of the, the goals, I think, of, of SUPAMO is to try to not duplicate the work that's already out there or being done, to try to find a way to collaborate in a way that is harmonious and fills gaps without overlapping. So that was the, um, the third party research. Next, the team did interviews and we had focus groups and there were surveys. Perry aggregated all of the interviews and the surveys and then we put that together with the focus group findings to come up with um, sort of top findings. And this is a list of digital tools that were the most common ones. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's um, what we heard most often in terms of what people were using. So the social media tools, accounting, project management, communications, event ticketing, emails, creation, accessibility, video, contact management. So as you can see that performing arts organizations are working in the digital field using digital tools. They just want to do more and try to figure out a way to be able to afford how to, to do it. Next. And then the, that was the, the result of the next question. What more would you like to do? So there was talk about creating mobile apps and voting and training people. Training was something that came up a fair bit. Uh, using digital in creation, getting to understand how to use digital tools better. So if you use MailChimp to do newsletters, sure, but what else can you do with it? And there are a lot of other things you can do. Learning about cutting edge technology like VR, archiving, digital marketing. Next. And then, as we were saying, in terms of what prevents you from doing more, funding, big issue. So, and this was across the board again with Everything that, uh, all the conversations we had, it was the challenges were about funding, staff, and knowing what to do. So even those who participated, and quite often the ones who participated in the focus groups were those who actually were technically savvy, that didn't have, um, had, were already using a lot, of the, a lot of digital tools, but they were looking for ways to help them train their other staff or the artists that um, their organizations support and how to cost effectively grow their knowledge base and grow their skills. And then we of course asked what as in specifically as an IPOC organization, what they were looking for that might set them up their needs apart distinct from a, a, a regular, not a regular, um, a non IPOC or mainstream organization. And it's all about building community. And, but not just building an arts community or an arts audience community, but reaching out to larger IPOG communities so that they can access uh, donors, board members, other skills that they might not have. But all the, the needs were based on building communities. So after that, those, that research, we then looked at, we asked, next slide, if CPAMO built a common platform, 
if we see if I have a, fulfill that role, what would you want it to do? And we got a lot of responses in terms of um, marketing support, message board, database, knowledge base, um, shared cost resources, uh, so that's negotiating discounts, uh, calendar, job posting, online festivals, wide range of things. And then we drilled down into what were the most common issues that came up. And next slide. And asked what more specifically, what would you like to see if that's what we were focused on building next? What came across the most often was resources. And that's, so that's coming back down to the, that common refrain of we need to know what to do, how to do it so we can use digital tools more. And they are looking for the wide range of resources. So articles, links, training manuals, videos, webinars, case studies, um, a list of consultants um, or digital facilitators that can be engaged frequently that the technological, technological skill that's needed is um, more expensive than the range of, of salaries that can usually be afforded in the arts space. So how to find people that maybe you can use on a shared cost basis or people who are willing to work at the, the more affordable rates. And building in commenting into knowledge sharing posts so that, the, again, there's a community of shared experience so you, people can talk about, I tried this and this worked or that didn't work. Calendars so that uh, there are events or deadlines, all that can be shared. And negotiating shared cost resources. So discounts on software licenses or technology or equipment. Then we'll look for the next slide, please. There was a lot of talk about a database for IPOC artists. There are a few other databases, and, and we'll be hearing a little bit later on from Culture Brew about what they're doing. Uh, there's another one for film and television uh, called Film and Color that specifically is on IPOC artists in film and television. So what kind of a database would this community like to see? And I think what sets it, the needs apart from some of the others that are out there is looking at more information what the artist is doing. So not just the contact information, but also the conceptual area where the artists work, links to their work, and lists of artist grants or awards. Next, and then Again, on the, the topic of community building, there was a, a discussion about chat or message board, and there was no clear preference for um, which people would like to see. A chat is more casual. Message board can be archived and searched so that people can go back to look for the information that might already be discussed. There were concerns about moderation and how to do that cost effectively, perhaps sharing responsibility for voluntary volunteer moderation. Um, make a private chat or message board be an element of a paid account, and that can be part of something that's discussed when there's a discussion about what the business model would be behind this board, behind the, the whole platform. And one interim low cost solution that was raised was having a Facebook group that would be closed um, and private, so you'd have to apply to join and have different CPAV organizations be volunteer moderators of that group. And that's like a, a no cost solution, just time. So, next, the other common uh, request was for opportunity postings. There are other job boards in culture, such as the work and culture job board, and they also have one for RFPs. But this is something that would be specific to the IPOC community and would be broader. So it would 
besides jobs, it would also include volunteer opportunities, call for submissions, networking opportunities. And it would be user generated so that the members could post their own um, opportunities when they are when they have them or when where they discover them. Next, in terms of IBPOC outreach, we talked about the need for community. There is a, there feels to be an equal need for, there's no priority for um, outreach to audiences, donors, board members, and academics. The, uh, the, the consultation group felt that each segment was equally important and that some groups might have a greater need for one or the other. Uh, so they should all be featured. There was also discussion about asking successful IPOC artists to be resources in the outreach, to engage them to uh, be advocates. So with all of that, next slide. Then we, we worked on, with all of that knowledge, what would we build? What would we propose? and came up with a three phase plan. The first build, the core build of a common platform with the unique URL would have in its first phase, the resource listing, calendar, links to existing job boards rather than creating something new, the ability to upload new content, link to a private Facebook book group rather than creating something new at that point and conduct outreach to other organizations. And then the final element would be the development and implementation of educational sessions. So the, the resource listing rather that is about finding this, the resources that are already out there and aggregating them and then providing some kind of a frame so that people are aware of what that is, what, how those resources can be used by them. So for example, running Zoom meetings, there are lots of resources out there about how to do it, but can you, how do you use Zoom for capturing a performance? Can you, or are there other platforms that are out there that are better suited for um, virtual audiences to performance? That's the sort of thing that could be a value to the, this, the arts, performing arts community. And then with the, the educational sessions are more about doing more webinars and one-on-one -on -one, uh, type, at this point, purely video uh, interaction to do the training, to get, bring people up to speed on how to use the tools and how to implement them for their organization either doing it as a group or as I said, one-on-one -on -one for their specific needs. Next slide. And then for phase two, it would be about expanding on that core build with additional funding to be able to create more content, allow the community aspect of commenting on articles, migrating the Facebook group to a discussion board, creating a member only paid section to build a business model. Once there's a, a large enough audience, then you can talk about discounts for shared resources, which when you don't know how many people you've got coming to the site is difficult to do. And then more sector specific how to webinars and videos. So expanding on the educational resources. And finally, the last slide. And then for the, the third phase, it would be with additional funding again, if there's still by that point um, is a need for a distinct database, building that and expanding with further content. Because this is a, a, an area where there's going to be always a need for content. Some of it can be user generated, but to get as technology is constantly changing, you'll have more reliable content if there is an allocation of funding to be able to pay people to write sector-specific 
content about how to use digital tools as they are developing. So that's... Sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, that was my Google Home. <laughs> in the background, sorry. Uh, so that's that. Uh, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Thank you, Kelly Lynn. Um, so as we we're saying, use the chat box if there are any questions. And if you have a Google voice in the background, you might want to <laughs> tell that it's nap time. Uh, but uh, Perry, any questions or comments coming up from uh, the chat room? Sure. There is a question. Um, is it possible for Sapamo to offer a free collective online gallery for members? Is it possible for Sapamo to offer a free online Free collective online gallery for members. What type of gallery? I, I mean, obviously, we're interested in exploring uh, for visual arts. Thank you. Oh, we're interested in exploring the possibilities. And so visual arts would be an area that we'd want to look at. Uh, right now, we're just trying to connect with what are the possibilities. And um, this would certainly be one. And then uh, obviously, what are the um, ways of getting it out? And um, I see another question coming in on that. Would people be paid for that? Of course. Um, you know, we would not want to use artist work online as a way of escaping artist fees. I guess there will be a question, though, in the future as to how that gets, uh, because visual arts, how that gets respected uh, in an online uh, way. Um, so we would be speaking with our um, connections at CARFAC uh, about that for guidance. Those are the only questions for now, Charles. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, speaker, yeah, it is a speaker. It's Jessa Agilo of ArtsBond. So, Jessa, over to you. Thank you, Kelly Lynn. Thanks, Charles. Just sharing my screen, make sure everyone gets it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, two um, interconnected projects, Hatch Open and Arts United, that are funded in a, with a multi uh, stage support of um, Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, for people that do not know me, uh, my name is Jessa Aguilo, and I am founder of Arts Pond. We're a, we see ourselves as a, a change maker in the arts and culture sector, uh, looking to boost healthy human ecosystems, both on the ground and in the cloud. We have many projects, um, including the Last My Gig, which some of you may have heard of most recently, um, and the uh, National uh, Digital ASO project that was launched uh, this month. Um, our values and mandate is really to try to promote equity justice from um, a kind of multi multi approach, uh, looking at social uh, uh, supporting greater social cohesion with equity seeking groups in mind. So indigenous, um, I, I, IDPOC, IDPOC basically, but also uh, vulnerable low income artists of different communities, uh, um, not just for, uh, for uh, greater collaboration, greater connection socially, but also looking at, at challenges around space. Uh, challenges around uh, economic uh, precarity and, and uh, digital justice. So what is actually digital justice? Um, from our point of view, it's been, it's taken like six years to really kind of um, move forward with that through some research of our own, uh, starting back in 2017, looking at the issues of uh, small creators and producers and how, how uh, we can uh, build software platforms that empower them. This was before the launch of the Digital Strategy Fund. We did two years of, of, of two national symposiums trying to bring the sector together, asking how ASOs can transform the digital world. And now we have two uh, digital strategy fund projects. Um, Hatch Open Arts United is one, and Digital ASO is a second that are currently funded by the Digital Strategy Fund. And I'm going to talk about um, a report called Research Insights, um, a Designing a Cooperative Digital Future for Managing the Arts. Um, that has, um, that's a part of this Hatch Open Arts United project. Unfortunately, like the, the uh, report is more, more than 150 pages. Uh, it was going to be published in March, but the pandemic got in the way. And uh, so it's not going to be released now until September. Uh, but I'm going to give you some insights on what's happening um, in terms of uh, our learnings from the research that we did. But just what are Hatch Open and Arts United quickly? So you have a sense of what I'm talking about. So Hatch Open is an open source 
enterprise or arts resource planning cloud software solution, prioritizing the needs of equity seeking gig workers in arts and culture. So small creators, uh, freelancers, producers, artists, managers, and their communities. In phase one, so an enterprise resource planning solution is like a, a multi-module solution that tries to meet all the business needs of an organization or in our case, uh, prioritizing individuals. So in phase one and two, uh, we're prioritizing financial management, project management, business intelligence with a lens around identifying impact and attracting investment in uh, artists' work with uh, a focus on visual performing and disability arts communities uh, to start. In phase three and four and five and six, which we don't have funding yet, we're gonna be building out other modules such as CRM or client relationship management, um, team and asset management. So eventually disseminating artwork and making it consumable, uh, whether it's your video or image for, for rent or for sale. Uh, and other kinds of modules in the long run, but financial project management, facilitating impact investing is really what we're prioritizing around the, the open source software for now. And then Arts United is a platform co-op that's going to be, uh, that's going to be powered by Hatch Open in an effort to uh, build a community around the software and facilitate those impact investments. And as a multi-stakeholder multi co-op, there will be workers, producers, consumers, patrons of the artists and potential investors of the platform itself as, uh, as member classes within the co-op. The co-op itself will be for profit. So the idea is that we're going to be uh, sharing uh, revenues, uh, like all surplus revenues in essence, once it's up and running, would uh, be uh, distributed out to members. The research report uh, is, um, sh that's coming in September now is uh, summarizing our design thinking research. So we did a bunch of human, uh, human design centered workshops in the, in the summer and fall last year uh, to get people's input, uh, similar to the panel report. What, what do you need? What do you want? What are your challenges? What are your opportunities uh, around digital? Uh, we looked at the, with some coaches, uh, we looked at the co-op development issues and what should the platform look like and how can we, what do we need to do to incorporate it and make it responsive to the community need. We looked at legal issues, both for the co-op and for the uh, software technology itself. And we looked at trying to identify a, an, a structure for evaluation to illustrate that impact, an actual approach to um, basically um, uh, like an indigenous, ideally where we want to get to is an indigenous led uh, worldview on evaluating and illustrating impact on the arts. That is including quantitative and qualitative in traditional European language, uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, storytelling and um, benchmarked kinds of um, evaluation. So I would just want to dive in uh, to the research report and, and a little bit, like I, I can't summarize 150 pages in, in 10 minutes, but give you some insight on what, what the topics are that are coming. So we had uh, 12 focus groups in Toronto called Focus It, and we did a tour across Ontario uh, called Focus Ontario. And there were six major areas that we were looking at, and I'm just going to quickly only summarize one of them uh, today. The digi what does your digital life look like? in terms of detail, but three issues, just to give you a sense, were uh, digital life, managing creativity and promote justice. So what does on digital life, what does a digital life in the arts look like to you ideally and in reality? What are your challenges and barriers to going to digital? And there are actually some participants in this call that, uh, that joined in on some of these sessions. So perhaps they may have some questions about this or can, you know, if I can't answer, they may be able to talk to some of their experiences with this. Mentoring creativity is how do you manage artistic creativity digitally, ideally, and in reality? And what does a positive, healthy, sustainable practice in arts, manage, arts management, arts administration look like to you? Then promote justice is really trying to get to how can the cooperative and working collaboratively uh, address some of the real systemic accessibility issues that we have around digital right now. So what do you need for digital arts management solutions to actually be accessible and collectively around the co-op, what can be done more powerfully together in the digital world? So I'm just gonna briefly give you what I heard uh, around the digital life and I, I just don't have time to do the rest, but wait eagerly for the report. 
uh, to come out soon. So some of the barriers that we heard were uh, being human and being creative, that digital doesn't necessarily um, uh, prioritize these things. And as artists and arts workers, this, these are like priority things in our lives that going digital, uh, and these are all quotes that we got from the respondent. So going digital often makes everything feel less real and it will always come down to flesh and blood at some point. And, the, and so we can't, the digital solutions are not the be and end all. We're always gonna come to human time, human decision making in the long run. And being creative, it's counterintuitive to actually try to develop, for some counterintuitive actually to try, try to develop a digital solution to help them with their creativity because it's counterintuitive to how they want to work and how they actually work with their creative practices. And that the, the, the siloing effect of administration wanting digital and artists wanting creative, non-digital analog ways of thinking is actually siloing how we use try to try to improve and develop good administrative best practices that they're just hindering time and effort around creativity. And that obviously communicate uh, time needed to communicate and, and spending time on administration is really eating time into their uh, creative practice to develop their, um, their artistic works. Other barriers are learning curves and fragmentation. So the more, I, the more I learn about digital, the more I realize I don't know. I think we've been hearing a lot about that kind of language with the digital strategy fund. The more we, the more we look into this, the more we don't know. But there's more unknown unknowns than there are known knowns or known unknowns. Uh, not knowing what is worth investing my time to learn around crit time for disability arts folks who you know, can't look at a screen for very long or, or for whatever accessibility challenges, needing to make decisions about how to use digital, it has an extra accessibility challenge for them. Um, and so can we try to be more uh, transparent about how it's going to benefit them in a really clear, concise and compelling way so they can make good decisions without having to invest a lot of time. So, the, and support them in that learning curve to make the decisions. And even like, even using Excel, a lot of people said, well, I actually don't know how to use Excel appropriately and I'm not comfortable with it. And so even the familiar is actually unfamiliar to me in terms of the actual digital. Fragmentation is real across all aspects of their uh, of their non digital and digital lives. Like their their um, analog files are really disorganized. And one said one person said my analog files. I look at them and they scatter like cockroaches when I even try to look at them. Paper and digital, and that so that our real lives are disorganized because we're overtasked and working too much. But that's then replicated in digital when we have tools themselves that are also fragmented, not talking to each other and can't make us, make us work in an efficient way. And that's tiring out the brains of our people that have uh, disability issues. It's just making them not able to shift between different tasks because they're just trying to figure out how to patchwork everything together. Productivity and accessibility, the pace of change and technologies impacting artists' productivity and working digitally common commonly takes a lot more time than first thought. Accessibility, being too immersed in the digital space, there is bad for my brain, and access to technology is limited to only those with the means. So there's like internet access and bandwidth, the cost of a computer, the cost of having a tablet, the cost of having a phone, the cost of non-financial time and learning software. There's so much that can go unpack. I'm just pulling like two out of 50 things here that we came, that came out of the research. Connectivity and privacy are two additional barriers. So losing our collective connections to the tactile world and social sphere. So that IRL in real life, where human, uh, being human and being creative is front and center, digital with a pandemic is really being exasperated, that we're in this digital, need to use digital, we're actually losing our real life connections that are core to how we work. And so we need the digital solutions to realize that human time is front and center and to empower that. And to not at the same time lose those people as we shift to digital, not at the same time lose people who are not engaged digitally. To have a digital system that helps empower our IRL in real life uh, conversations with people. Whether it's better timekeeping or better scheduling, like I don't know how many times I've gone to uh, you know, a calendar app trying to schedule a meeting and having to go through 13 emails just to schedule a 15 minute meetup with someone. 
So we can have better digital tools that allow us to engage with those people in real life uh, without making it so difficult, then that would be a good thing. Privacy, that's like a big issue around ownership of data and, and how is my digital profile being used in the community. And decisions about, about activating ourselves in digital life is actually a political decision. And we don't have a lot of power in making those decisions. Those are often empowered by, uh, by Facebook, by Google, by Amazon, the big uh, corporations. And so we have a lot of lack of control around ownership and privacy. And we're giving up a lot and we don't necessarily always understand what we're giving up in the, in the process. So I'm running out of time. So I just want to get to, um, I want to get to some of the wants and needs. So I'm just going to skip through this uh, presentation is available for anyone that wants to look at it. Accessibility and automation. Yes, not to use the human element. One integrated platform is what people want, but you know it's going to take 10 years and 30 million to build one integrated platform that meets the whole needs of the whole art sector. Like it's not it's not going to happen right away. But what can we do the best? What can we do to help ease the the process around accessibility and that there's not a patchwork of systems that they at least talk to each other. Automation that they want the, the software to learn from their experience how they use it and to push things back to them that they haven't realized. Oh, did you know you have this audience member you've not engaged in three years, but they connect to your vision in this way, in this way, in this way. They're a great prospect. So to anticipate um, opportunities, but also just activities that are coming up with lots of auto reminders and so on. Uh, connectivity and customiz cu customizability are also big issues where um, uh, kind of that wet social presence, um, discover wanting uh, tools that are going to support connecting in the digital world, finding new artists, finding new um, practices, new trends, new technologies, a communal place to plug into other shared communities and develop relationships. Customizability, the software can't be fixed. It has to be adjustable, flexible, to how a person wants to look. So an example I think that's relatively good is MailChimp in designing a newsletter. It's drag and drop how you want to use the interface to create your content. And it, it's, it will adapt and, and move based on what uh, interface, what kind of device you're using or what interface you're looking at. We really want something that's going to visualize and share the data in a way that is fully customizable, and that's going to require a certain amount of robust um, back-end development that isn't easily done. Uh, and they want the technology to learn along with me and develop because of that learning. Openness and ecology, ecology considerations are also wants and needs. So no proprietary uh, files, software codecs around different files, and that the artistic process is and the business processes that are involved in the software are also very open and well connected and well documented so that the artist artistic team and the business team are seamlessly connected into the one tool it's not an artistic tool and a, and a management tool separated the the uh, digital footprint of, of cloud computing is massive and there are lots of concerns around uh, developing software and developing hardware solutions that I take that into account. So uh, there are, there's still more, but I'm at my limit. If, if, if I'm giving me a go ahead to have like a two more, I would mention them, insights and literacy resources, mostly around business intelligence that Okay, what is that? What is, what is impact evaluation? What is our impact in the sector? If we're gonna develop an impact investing platform co-op, how do we actually illustrate impact? And one user said, well, actually it's like, it's a truth. It's a truth about who we are, how we work. And that's what I want the business intelligence to share. That's a big tall order to illustrate and share truths, but that's what is now under the core of what we're trying to accomplish. The literacy resources are really replicating what Sapamo uh, mentioned, so I don't think I necessarily need to duplicate that. That's all pretty good common knowledge. Around the co-op, I just quickly want to mention we have launched an artist residency program from mid-June to October, and we're looking for three artists, $2,500 each, a visual artist, a performing artist, and a disability artist to help us envision the platform co-op side of uh, Hatch Open and Artsy United. So we're taking applications now. 
with, so if you know anyone, we're prioritizing IPOC and equity-seeking groups. So I'd love to have your insights. And that's it. Thank you so much for letting me go over time. Thank you, Jessa. Uh, very important use of time. Um, so no worries there. Uh, Perry, any questions that we're seeing on chat box? No, not at the time. Okay. Uh, not seeing any questions. Can we go on to Valerie and Anju? This is Culture Brew. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to get set up here. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Valerie Singh Turner, and um, my colleague and co-conspirator, Andrew Singh, we are representing um, our digital initiative, culturebrew.art, which is um, created by uh, Visceral Visions. And um, I thank Charles for the opportunity to present our work. And I also want to thank you for the land acknowledgement um, that you offered at the beginning, Charles. Um, Andrew, if you want, are you ready to move to the next slide? Yeah, I think I am. Okay. So um, as part of an important online conversation that allows indigenous and racialized artists from across Turtle Island to connect with each other, we at Visceral Visions would like to acknowledge that we are participating from the unceded and ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, colonially, colonially known as Vancouver. Great. We also wish to acknowledge the long and storied history of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes their ongoing battle for human rights, territorial, territorial rights, and social justice, a fight that benefits every single one of us. We are grateful for their leadership, courage, and sacrifice, which informs and inspires our work and aspirations as artists who have the privilege of calling these stolen territories home. I just want to make sure everyone can see the presentation. Uh, yeah, Anju, it's, it's, it's on the screen. It's fine. Okay, you're on this white slide with the acknowledgement. Yep, I can see that. Here we are. Okay, great. So Visual Visions was founded in 2003 as a nonprofit society with a mandate to champion diverse provocative voices that struggle to be heard in an increasingly homogenized world through the media of artistic expression and to promote and foster indigenous and racialized Canadian artists. So I just wanna pause here for a second um, and start with this first statement. So racial bias, discrimination, prejudice, plus power equals racism. The callous murder of George Floyd once again highlights the America's contemptible levels of police brutality rooted in white supremacy. While this most recent act of aggression took place in the United States, Canada shares the same colonial roots and we are similarly afflicted with a system that perpetuates systemic inequality resulting in countless unnecessary deaths and the criminalization of people of color at a disproportionate rate. Colonialism plus white supremacy plus power equals systemic racism. The distressing increase in anti-Asian hate crimes during the pandemic is also symptomatic of our white supremacist underpinnings. Until we as a society are fully committed to the dismantling of white supremacy, Black, Indigenous, and racialized members of marginalized communities will continue to suffer systemic or structural racism. And those systems of inequality also pervade the Canadian art sector. If we acknowledge that all media influence thought and behavior, then what we do and represent on stage and on screen has real world consequence consequences. And if we as artists are not engaging with the realities of this world in the here and now, then what the fuck are we doing? As um, anti-apartheid and human rights activist, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, 
you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Canadian arts and culture have the power to positively impact systemic racism and white supremacy if its systems were properly decolonized. So this comes to the next piece, which is what is culture brewed dot art? And I'm just going to throw up, um, this is our homepage. So culture brewed dot art is a, is a project that we've been working on since 2018 that actually um, Valerie had uh, conceptualized in 2015. So it's been quite a few years in the making in terms of the concept. And um, the project actually is, uh, I really appreciated the points brought up earlier about the importance of research and uh, not just building something out of um, thinking that it's necessary, but actually having research backed and data backed um, projects. So this project was very heavily researched and it was, there was lots of consultation with indigenous and racialized artists and as well with the people that would be engaging those artists. So organizations, arts um, companies, um, and we will talk a little bit more about who we think will be using this platform. So the platform um, is based on the concept that basically one of the biggest misconceptions by white engagers is the false conclusion that since they're unable to find indigenous and racialized artists, they just simply don't exist, which is clearly incorrect. Um, and an outreach problem, this is an outreach problem, they can't find these people, is conflated with a lack of supply. So with the searchable database being the central tool of culturebrew.art, we envision it to be a web platform that would do quite a few different things. So um, before I go into what the platform does, I just wanted to give you some screenshots because we're pretty excited about it. Um, this is the this is my profile. <laughs> I'm sharing with you um, what I put up there. So this is um, as an artist, I can choose to publish or unpublish um, my profile so that therefore I can have some privacy and um, you know, your name is up there, headshot, which is really, really important for lots of artists. Um, this one section on the left here is a quick screenshot of her filters. And because um, Sapemo is, I believe, centered in Ontario, I did an Ontario search <laughs> to show you there are people in Ontario here. And so then what you can do is you can actually search by um, province, you can search by discipline, and you can search by ethnicity. This is actually the artist search page. Um, we do have a more complex feature for um, engagers to search, which will go even deeper into uh, potentially even sexual orientation, so long as the artist has given permission, um, and potentially into um, different types of abilities, just to make sure we're increasing equity. On the right, I stole uh, Valerie's profile here. Um, and you can see that there is a way to connect with the artist if you want to send them a message via the internal messaging system and a little bit about her. So um, this actually goes longer, but um, I didn't put it all there. So we're envisioning that Culture Brew Art is a web platform that includes um, promoting and fostering intersectional interculturalism, building connection, collaboration, and community. That's a big piece of this. It's not just transactional, but um, relationship-based uh, approach interdisciplinary. So this is performing arts, but we actually also included media arts. I'm a media artist and there's a lot of performance in media arts. And um, we had a really um, big discussion around this as well. Accessible, national in scope, prioritizing artist safety and privacy, providing digital tools to facilitate artistic practice and solidarity, and created by racialized artists for Indigenous and racialized artists with an interracial, ra intersectional racial equity lens. Um, so culturebrew.art, or CBA, is envisioned to serve two distinct communities. The first, and our priority, of course, are Indigenous and racialized artists. So this group includes everyone from performers, actors, dancers, musicians, singers, from opera to hip hop, um, directors for the stage, for screen, fight directors, stunt coordinators, intimacy directors, technical directors, production directors, creators from writers, filmmakers, composers, choreographers, 
and behind the scenes artists such as set, costume, sound, lighting, and projection designers, dramaturgs, producers, cultural workers in the film and broadcast industry, and anyone else who considers themselves a cultural worker. Oops, sorry. Catching up here on our screen. So our other distinct community um, is comprised of individuals and organizations seeking to employ indigenous and racialized artists, such as theater, opera and dance companies, music and other cultural um, festivals, sorry, I skipped over film, TV, casting and production, indie producers and artist collectives, and of course, indigenous and racialized artists wanting to find like-minded artists to collaborate with. And since our goal is systemic disruption, in addition to the arts and cultural sector, Culture Buddha Art will be promoted to schools seeking artists to work with students, post-secondary training programs seeking faculty and guest artists, community and social service agencies seeking artists to work with immigrants, refugees, BIPOC queer youth and other marginalized groups, ad agencies and other businesses, and government and funding agencies seeking to fill arts advisories and peer juries. So the project is in its second phase. So phase one is what we'd call the MVP, which is minimal vi minimum viable product. And it's a searchable database of indigenous and racialized artists, as I mentioned. Um, and it includes an artist portal and engager portal. Engagers are the people engaging with the artists and an internal messaging system to connect with other artists. Um, and the artist portal is where BIPOC artists can sign up, create a profile, provide searchable data such as their background, gender, sexual orientation, disabilities, artistic discipline, as well as portfolio materials just such as uh, bios, artist statements, images, et cetera, et cetera. Um, artists pay an annual fee of $25. We do have a promo going on and we have a special Sapama code that we've created. We'll uh, give that, we'll tell you about that at the end. Um, and what we're, and then we have, oh, sorry. I, I didn't finish the engager portal. Um, is anyone looking to set up artists? Um, they set up their own profile and then they can search for artists or create opportunities. That's the two things that the engagers can do. Um, we had originally officially launched in September um, after passing quality assurance and accessibility testing. But um, after some more testing, we realized that there were some features that needed work. We use an agile and iterative approach. We are always experimenting and learning. And so the idea is that we heard the feedback and we are responding. So we are making improvements already. Um, those functional improvements are underway and we are actually really pleased with some of the changes that have already been deployed. Um, phase two, which is our current phase is um, due to some uh, really, we're grateful for more funding from the Digital Strategy Fund from the Canada Council for two projects. One is a mobile app and the other is additional features for culturebrew.art. And the additional features that we're really looking to add um, are things such as, and depending on research, again, we wanna really uh, engage with our community to find out what they want, but we're thinking a video conferencing system that's safe and secure, private, and doesn't get Zoom bombed by people saying weird racist stuff. Um, CV Builder is something we talked about. I had a friend write to me the other day and say, is this a good CV? It wasn't. And I think that um, giving them some kind of support in that way is a really good idea. Um, calendar events featuring CBA artist members, moderated forums, potentially advocacy tools. These are all open for discussion and uh, for research. So the tech world, as we discovered, is like most systems of power, very white and very male. Our efforts to ensure that we're not perpetuating the same systemic barriers and the development of CBA involves a constant process of interrogation to consider the ever evolving language, terminology and systems of oppression while exploring opportunities to educate all users, whether artist or subscriber or engager as they navigate the site. CBA is a prime example of the culmination and evolution of our community driven work for racial equity, an initiative grounded as Andrew mentioned in accumulated knowledge, formal research and community consultation um, uh, that has been um, part of our process right from the very beginning. 
in recognition of the fact that indigenous and racialized folks, um, particularly women of color, suffer higher rates of online harassment, um, CBA has developed certain protocols to maintain a safer online space for indigenous and racialized artists to engage with each other and the people and organizations who wish to employ them. This includes um, requiring that only paid subscribers, not the general public, are given access to culturebrew.art. Having a fee-for-service model discourages would-be trolls who currently roam free platforms with impunity, as we well know, like Facebook and Twitter. Um, for more sensitive personal information, such as gender, sexual orientation, and disability, Indigenous and racialized artists are given the option to limit the sharing of such information to only other artists who share the same identity. For example, a trans artist might only want to be searched and found by other trans artists in CBA, or they may be willing to be found by all the other artists in CBA, but not with potential engagers um, or subscribers. Um, we worked with a certified professional privacy consultant and a lawyer with a background in human rights to develop our code of conduct and terms of service, which are published on CBA site and to which every artist and every subscriber engager must actively agree to in order to gain access to the artists. Um, because indigenous and black women in particular are often targeted online for human trafficking as well as gender-based violence and harassment, we set up our payment processor to make it mandatory for everyone, whether artist or subscriber, to provide their full legal name and credit card information in order to discourage would-be perpetrators and make it easier to locate those who contravene our code of conduct and or terms of service. For um, Indigenous and racialized artists who find um, a credit card to be a barrier to participation, we are committed to personalized assistance and manual activation that will allow them to join the community once they have provided the information to verify their identity. Um, we've set aside some of our budget to ensure that CBA conforms with accessibility standards of WCAG 2.0 to level to level AA. Part of the budget paid for the services of a company who provided culturally diverse testers with disabilities who use assistive devices to access the internet. Um, Visceral Visions received special approval from the BC Human Rights Tribunal in response to our application for an exemption under section 42, paragraph three of the Human Rights Code, um, which will allow Culture Bruta Art to restrict the provision of our services to self-identified indigenous and racialized artists. Section 42, paragraph two of the Human Rights Code allows the tribunal to approve any program that, quote, has as its objective the amelioration of conditions of disadvantaged individuals or groups. So what this means in practice is that Visual Visions and by extension culturebrew.art and the artists in culturebrew.art are protected from any nuisance lawsuits or claims of discrimination by white artists for their exclusion or their exclusion from culturebrew.art. Um, we are committed to continuing to work with a certified privacy professional who is also a woman of color to ensure that all of our policies and procedures um, promote online safety, privacy, and protection from identity theft, as well as harassment. This ongoing process will include staff training, as well as promoting digital literacy among our users, both artists and subscribers. And finally, <laughs> All the data in culturebrew.art is securely hosted on servers located in Canada with CanTrust Hosting Cooperative. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, the Patri Act, which passed you know, after 9-11, increased the American government's surveillance powers, allowing the FBI to force anyone at all, including internet service providers, to turn over records of their clients and customers. And then more recent legislation gives the American government the ability to compel Canadian subsidiaries of American companies to turn over their records as well. So this is especially concerning for Indigenous and racialized artists, many of whom are also activists and outspoken critics of the powers that be. So it was very important for us to um, ensure that 
all of our work and data is hosted in Canada with Canadian companies. Um, we understand that we've gone over time and we sincerely apologize for this. It's difficult to talk about a project of this scope with such uh, complex issues behind it in 10 minutes. I'm going to quickly run through the rest so that we can uh, finish off fast as possible. Um, thanks everyone for being so patient. So the CBA leadership is a new TRI-ED leadership model. This is meant to dismantle the structure of the project uh, being decolonial and really pushing against traditional systems, bureaucratic, corporate, capitalist systems. Uh, colonial systems, we are doing a flattened leadership, which includes three co-executive directors. We have Valerie Singh Turner's creative director and co-executive director, Kona, who's our community development director and co-executive director, and myself as a technical director and co-executive director. Um, we gratefully acknowledge the support of all of our funders. We have been uh, this wouldn't be possible without them. And we want to acknowledge that our technical developer is Affinity Bridge, who've been incredible to work with. And our technical uh, advisor is actually from Cantress Hosting Cooperative, Damian Norris. Um, we wanted to just quickly flag here that we did set up, um, we want to provide everyone in attendance today who wanted to get a free year membership into culturebrew.art to um, sign up at this link, culturebrew.art backslash sapamo, and we will send you a link as soon as it's ready. Um, and everyone else who, with or without the link, you can join at join.culturebrew.art. Thank you, um, Anju and Valerie. And Perry, I've noticed quite a few questions. There are a few questions. We'll start at the top. Who monitors who is Indigenous? Well, so um, I'll let Valerie explore more. But really, from what I understood when I was starting the position and I talked to Valerie about this and we were really having these conversations, we really let people self-identify because um, the idea of telling people, especially when it comes to being white passing or telling people what um, racial heritage they have or they don't have is really not our place. Um, Valerie, would you like to expand on that? Yeah, I, this is an ongoing question um, and conversation that I've had with different artists, especially Indigenous artists. And um, as Andrew said, it's not our job to police people, to tell um, people who they are. Um, there is also the possibility, because it has happened before, that people claim Indigenous heritage without actually having um, a connection to um, their community. Um, but usually the Indigenous community is pretty good about um, calling those people out. And so uh, we have um, a, a process that people can contact us and let us know if they have an issue with a particular person or the community does and we'll, you know, deal with it then. But at the moment, we are trusting people to um, say who they are. Next question. Um, would you consider adding writers and visual artists to the listings? Well, writers are already invited, um, and that means writers of all kinds, playwrights, screenwriters, poets, novelists, long form. We, we believe if you're a writer, it doesn't matter which um, form you write in, you can, you're a writer. Um, visual artists um, is a little bit different. Um, it's a whole different area that we're not familiar with, and so we would have to do more research because I think the needs of visual artists are quite different from performing artists and media artists. Um, so um, it's on our radar, our radar, but unfortunately it's not um, a priority at the moment. However, visual artists do, I mean, you know, have overlap with um, the performing arts. I know visual artists who also set designers and video and projection designers. Um, and so they can be part of culture brew art if they want to um, use their visual art skills uh, or have experience using their visual art skills, um, working, collaborating with other artists in that way. Another question is, um, platform be unilingual or have language-based preferences? Um, so the first part of your question was a bit distorted, Perry, but I think you were talking about other languages other than English. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, yes, indeed. Okay, so um, right now it is in English. Um, it is 
quite expensive, as I understand, for us to convert everything. Um, our focus in phase one was to simply make sure we had um, a functioning minimum viable product. Um, of course, we are going to be looking at however we can make the site more accessible to as many marginalized people as possible and other languages such as, you know, Chinese or um, indigenous languages or, um, you know, South Asian languages, all of those are really important as well. Um, but again, it depends on funding and it depends on um, the priorities that the community is um, communicating to us. And also, I just want to add one thing there, Perry, is that we've built the site in Drupal 8, and Drupal actually has excellent capacity to support multilingual sites. Um, we just haven't pursued that yet, so it is a little bit lower on our priority scale. As I mentioned, we're using agile iterative approach, so we're going feature by feature. We're kind of working in smaller scope, um, and so um, potentially in the future, based on uh, co consultation, we may um, include that. And one last question. Did you research how much community engagers would be willing to pay and will there be discounts available for artist organizations and associations? So yes, we did some preliminary research with engagers um, or potential engagers. Um, you know, it ranged from people going, we really need this and we'll pay and other people insisting that it should be free. Um, we're not listening to those, to those people. <laughs> um, and, um, and yes, there will, so there'll be, um, we've, we worked with a business consultant to develop a five tier system um, based on annual revenues of uh, uh, organizations or individuals. Um, we've tried to keep in mind um, to be as affordable as possible. And, um, and we'll be testing it, like when the Engager portal is actually up, you know, we will be pro uh, posting those rates then and allowing people to give us feedback about, and, and of course with the pandemic and everybody, the arts or um, sector kind of um, pulverized uh, by this, um, we will be looking at how we might, you know, offer a pandemic kind of special to help people out. Um, we definitely will be offering discounted rates to um, charities, registered charities and nonprofits, and an even bigger discount to indigenous and racialized or organizations um, whose mandate um, serves indigenous and racialized artists. Is that it for our final question? There have been a number of comments to you, Valerie and Anju. So we'll, we're able to uh, save the, um, the file for the questions and comments. We'll pass those on to you. Uh, we, can, we can look at them now as uh, we go into the next speaker. Great. Thank you, Thank you so much for the opportunity pr to present. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your work. You. Uh, we're now going to shift to um, Sean and Victoria from Tangled Arts. Great. Thanks so much, Charles. Um, this has been such an energizing uh, day so far. I'm so excited to hear about all of the different projects that are happening and, and the possibilities for collaboration. Um, before we begin, just for anyone who might need it, I'm going to give um, a brief description of myself. I'm a, an East Asian, visibly disabled um, artist and curator. I am wearing these kind of steampunky glasses. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and hopefully in the background I have this kind of space agey uh, background. <laughs> um, and uh, my colleague Victoria Ann Warner, um, I don't know, do you want to also describe yourself just so folks know it, we're, we're presenting together? Yep, so my name is Victoria Ann Warner, and I am a white, queer, disabled madwoman, and I am currently wearing a purple plaid shirt with some kind of 50s style glasses, and behind me are nerdy firefly posters and a yellow wall. <laughs> um, so before we begin, I thought it would be really good to just give a bit of an overview around what it is we do here at Tangled. Um, 
Tangled is a disability arts organization. We are fully led by um, staff members who are from the disability community. And when I say that, I um, mean from the, uh, the larger umbrella of deaf, mad, disabled, neurodiverse, sick, uh, chronically ill folks. Um, and I think it's important to mention that uh, disability arts has a very distinct set of cultural practices. And uh, many of them are rooted in ideas of accessibility, uh, disability rights, and disability justice. Um, and so what we do at Tangled is to exhibit mad, deaf, disabled artists, but also uh, we really integrate accessibility into what it is we do. We think of accessibility not as a sort of uh, means to an end, but rather accessibility as really a way to resist traditional aesthetics. And um, we hope that uh, accessibility can be something that is exciting, that's something um, beautiful, and it's something that can truly become a cultural aesthetic. And that's sort of how we approach this idea of um, digital spaces is thinking about how we can center um, a disability politic within what we do. Particularly, I think it's uh, really important that in the context of digital spaces, there's been a push towards this idea of universal design and universal access. And um, it's often been the sort of driver behind a lot of the practices and the historical, it, it's historically been linked to the fight for um, independent living through uh, the disability rights movement. However, what's, in, what's, uh, what's sort of emerged more recently is the recognition that um, we need to center disability in our design practices and not simply use the excuse of universal design as being uh, good for everyone and that's why we need to do it. Because universal design oftentimes is justified through an able-bodied lens and is justified through this idea of what is a productive way of creating access. And so folks who, for instance, might require accessibility um, that is distanced from this idea of legislation um, are oftentimes left without um, protection. And I think this idea that accessible design is good for everyone is definitely a maxim that um, has, has been able to help push a lot of accessibility legislation, but we really need to go beyond that. And those, those accessible practices have been rooted in disability culture and the kind of anti-assimilationist politics that disabled folks have engaged that way. Um, something that um, disability scholars like uh, Kelly Fritch and Amy Hamrai would define as uh, crip techno science and crypt techno science sort of identifies those different ways that disabled folks have uh, really historically uh, created their own practices um, of, of kind of knowing and making the world. And that's been a really important way that we approach um, the digital strategies uh, grants is to really center disability experience as knowledge keepers and knowledge holders of, of practices that are um, very much rooted in uh, these kind of anti-assimilationist uh, strategies. Uh, importantly, I think we, our, we've also been very much rooted in disability justice and disability justice really uh, centers the lived experiences of those between the nexus of disability, um, race, uh, queerness, transness, um, class, uh, the different ways in which disability um, is affected by in, in all communities. I think historically disability has been taken up largely within white circles and the voices and the contributions of BIPOC folk have largely been elided. And so because of that, disability justice makes space for the complexities that is um, our, our ecosystem and our world. And um, because of that, I think we have really wanted to center this idea of collaboration, of interdependence, um, and on, on how we might gain and uh, provide knowledge through an exchange. And I'm gonna let 
uh, Victoria maybe speak a bit more about this idea of, of digital spaces being vital. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I'm going to, I guess, talk about why digital spaces are vital to the deaf, disabled, and uh, mad communities. Um, I want to thank Jessa for bringing up um, concerns around accessibility of digital spaces, um, because that is another big part of as we create more of them. Um, but so digital spaces, however, have been and continue to be vital for our communities because historically we have experienced isolation from each other and barriers to building community and movement, either from not having access to each other geographically, like you don't know anyone in your community uh, that is also disabled or access to accessible spaces to meet or financial issues or, or, or there are many different barriers. So once the, once our community was able to access online communities, it has been, a, a, well, I said vital law, but, but essential to building the disability justice movement. Um, so these spaces can greatly increase the capacity of individuals within them um, to do the work and to participate or even mean that they can participate at all. Um, uh, so uh, currently, right now, because of the pandemic and because of all of this influx of digital options over the last few months, we've been greatly, um, uh, <laughs> we've been greatly benefiting from that. Um, there has been some, I will say, there has been some frustration from, from the community that a lot of these options were so quickly made available once they have now been seen to be beneficial to non-disabled, non-deaf, non-mad people. And this is a historical cycle that happens, that uh, we have these options to make things more accessible, but until the value to non-disabled people is seen, they are not made accessible, they are not valued, they are not prioritized. Even though most of the time, they really do have value to everybody. It's on a very simple level, you can look at something like a, a power door. Um, a, a power door makes it so that somebody in a wheelchair who might not be able to open a door can get through, but it's also useful for delivery people. It's also useful for people with strollers. So um, it's that, but on a much larger, much larger scale. Um, now, I know everybody else was kind of talking um, more about what their specific projects are at the moment. Um, what I wanted to focus on though was what we've learned about how valuable digital research has been to the projects we've completed. Um, so over the past few years, um, I'm sorry, I haven't said this, sorry, I'm the research coordinator at Tangle. Um, over the last few years, um, I've been working on a few different projects and it is now an integral piece that we use every single time. Um, and there are benefits to doing this, possibly, obviously. Um, so the first is that we have our responsibility as organizations who are seeking to uplift and value marginalized inter intersectional voices. And part of that is that we need to find out who we are not hearing from and who we are hearing from. And when you do digital research and you do surveys, you can then start collecting those statistics. Um, and with that kind of research, you can also cast a wider net and reach a wider audience. Um, and it also lowers this wider but shallower kind of net, also lowers the barrier for participation. So people who may not have interacted with you before may feel more comfortable or the, the, because the, the ask is a little bit smaller than coming in for like a couple hours of a focus group where you're with all these people you don't know. Um, it, there's just, it's, it's an easier entry point for a lot of people. Um, so it gives you that picture. Um, but doing this, we also, I feel like everybody listening here kind of knows that um, this does not automatically mean you're going to start hearing from previously unheard voices because we have to understand that we have there is historical historically built mistrust um, 
So we have to take that into account and really work on, as, as, as has been mentioned, building relationships with communities. And this will take time. It's, it took time to build up this mistrust and it will take time to dismantle it because there are fears of tokenization and of empty promises and <laughs> so on and so forth. Um, so, sorry. So, um, one of the other benefits of this research is that you can increase uh, your, hang on, sorry, I'm looking at my notes and I just got a little bit lost. Um, so, one of the other benefits to trying to bring in previously unheard voices is that with digital survey options and digital research, so you can give people the option to participate anonymously. And for a lot of people, when reporting issues or barriers, that is sometimes their biggest hurdle to being able to actually participate. And I've had a lot of, I have a lot of people who do identify themselves. I also have a lot of people who don't. And I value their input. They often have great things to say. Um, so, the other thing, and this is what has come up with, as I've now worked on a few projects where there's a few organizations doing research, is making sure we understand that it also benefits our in-person focus groups and town halls. You can use it to inform your in-person research and uh, with casting that wider, shallower net, what you can do is make sure you're hearing those stories from everybody because there is the issue of when you're in a town hall, you only have so much time. You can't necessarily hear from every single person. But with that digital online research, you can get every single story and you can get that quantitative data that says, yes, me too, yes, me too. It will also help you start to highlight issues that you may want to delve deeper into. So this research then gives you that opportunity to have a deeper, more meaningful conversation when you do bring people together. Um, so uh, another important angle that uh, we focus on at Tangled is asking for the input, input and expertise from the community when it comes to building those solutions. And this has been mentioned today already, um, but for too long, and this is very uh, a big thing within the deaf, disabled, and mad communities that research about us has been about us and not done with us. It's often done. They ask. They people talk to caregivers. They talk to medical professionals, but they don't actually talk to us. Um, and they don't. Or if they do, what they do is they ask for our stories. They ask us to share our pain and our trauma, but they do not ask us how we think the solution should be applied. Um, and this is due to systemic ableism that infantilizes us, that sees us as, as, you know, not able to know what is best for us because we are, because we are disabled. Um, and the uh, last point on bringing people in to do that research is we need to be compensating people for their labor. Um, with Tangled, whenever we bring somebody in for a, a, a focus group or um, interviews, we are paying them at consultant rates. Uh, for the larger, wider uh, surveys, we're not able to at this point. But if you are bringing people in to ask for their surveys, and it needs to be like we, we pay 80 to 100 dollars an hour usually for everybody because they're coming in that is their lived experience and we have to acknowledge and value that um i will mention briefly um uh our sorry i just need to switch files um i'm going to briefly mention the project we are working on at the moment um, our digital strategies project at the moment has a few different angles. Uh, one of the things we're doing is looking at our um, website and just making sure like the accessibility is there and we're tracking it over the our communications managers on that. Um, but the, the research 
research that will be coming out from us soon. So, uh, so if you're interested, please follow us. I will be posting links in the future to this. Is where if we're going to be speaking to our community to find out what like the the basics, kind of like what technology and software are people using to access um, our communities? What's working for them? What isn't? What kind of information do they find useful for us? Um, what kind of barriers have they experienced? Um, what kind of community do they want out of us? Um, because we've not had the opportunity to do that before with our community specifically. So we're very excited to go in and do that. Um, but I think right now the, the big thing I did want to focus on was really about when, as organizations, we're, we're starting to get these research projects going of making sure we're making our, our research um, complement each other and and kind of yeah just getting the most out of it that we can while making sure we're uplifting more voices yeah um, I just want to add to that um, this idea that we are trying to build um, a larger ecosystem so we're we're bringing in other disability arts organizations who are taking on different aspects of how to build disability culture into the larger arts ecosystem from which we've previously been excluded from. And so I think it's, it's, it, it's very urgent to recognize that we're trying to democratize and, and open up different like virtual and digital ways of gathering. And, you know, I think in our current era of just heightened visibility and surveillance, you know, it's, it's rapidly increasing global disability injustice. And so the oppression that Victoria's mentioned through ableist logic. Like we want to make sure that as digital platforms are being built, that the that the experiences um, of accessibility are are actually centering disabled people. And um, this research is being done by by really positioning disabled folks as the experts and to to recognize what it is that. Um, we need to know as we are participating in partnerships, as we're building uh, different sorts of platforms, whether they're our own digital, internal or external. Thank you, Sean and uh, Victoria. Any questions, comments, uh, Perry, on the chat line? Nope, not this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, we'll be, um, you know, if people have questions or comments as we go along, don't worry about it. We will get back if we haven't been able to answer them today. Um, we now have the next presenters. Again, thank you, Victoria and Sean, um, who Amy Mashinsky and Chris Sonnenen, um, King Opera Company National Ballet. Over to you two. This is our final presentation, and I'll make a couple of comments at the end as to what's happening next. I think Chris has got something yep. to share. So great, thank Can you. We Okay. Oh, sorry. It's just, yeah, it's up. I'm just trying to get my notes uh, re ready to go. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, first, uh, I'd like to say thank you to Charles and Sapamo for organizing this event. Uh, I know for those of you who received funding from Canada Council's Digital Strategy Fund, we know that one of the key outcomes of the funding is to share our, our, our knowledge more broadly with the sector. Um, and that outcome was a, a core principle of both the digital stage and the digital reach uh, that, that Chris Sonneman will speak to. Um, so we're thrilled to, to be here today to present our findings. So the digital stage um, was generously funded by uh, the Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, it was a partnership with the National Ballet of Canada and the Canadian Opera Company, as well as the Screen Industries Research and Training Center at um, Sheridan College. And we launched this project as a way uh, to gain literacy and to begin preparing the sector for the technologies that have the ability to both enhance but also disrupt um, the performing arts. And we knew that our, our organizations, and indeed many performing arts organizations, simply did not have enough knowledge to be ready for the digital future that's uh, coming to us. Um, so we engaged an organization called Kersmith Design to, to do a couple of pieces of research for us. Um, the first one being an environmental scan, um, which really 
and allowed us to begin to understand what technologies are already being deployed in the creation, presentation, and reception of the, um, of the performing arts. And that full report can be found at uh, digitalstage.ca, but I'm gonna give you a couple of the highlights uh, right now. Um, in terms of performing creation, performance creation, we really looked at how artists are beginning to use technologies to actually create the work. Um, in terms of performance delivery, we looked at both traditional and non-traditional methods of presenting that work and performance reception, how audiences are beginning to use new tools to actually receive that art. And Chris is going to speak about the technologies that we looked at, um, but I wanted to let you know that we're in the third phase, third and final phase of this project, uh, which is the testing phase. Um, it's underway right now, and we're, we're testing some of these technologies and their practical applications to the performing arts. So we hope to post some of those results uh, this summer. The second part of our research we called the Horizon Scan, and it was intended to look further into the future to see what signals are emerging that could have significant impact on the performing arts in Canada. And so while there are technologies that we explored through the environmental scan, these are the ones that are just starting to pop up on the horizon that, that could have uh, significant impacts. To frame that research, we identified the seven major drivers of change that are happening in Canada right now. Um, the age demographics as the population gets older, multicultural Canada as we rely for our population growth on immigration, of course reconciliation, urbanization and the trend towards uh, people um, moving towards the city, the rapid technology advancement that's really disrupting um, many of our organizations and the way we do business, automation and the impacts of uh, moving away from human-based jobs to machine-based jobs, and the climate crisis. And with these drivers of change in mind, we explored how technology may continue to impact performing arts in the next 15 to 30 years. We considered the ways in which creators will enhance performance, how non-human roles may continue to expand, and it's something we're already starting to see in film. And we sought to answer the question, will these changes cross over to the live performing arts? And if they do, how can we ensure that the sector is ready? One of the most interesting questions that I thought and, and one of the most robust discussions that we had was the conversation around what is live. So I, I think about that in terms of if we have the tools now and wide adoption of those tools in the future that can allow us to hear, see and feel a live experience through a virtual lens and also interact with other virtual humans, is that experience live? even if we're participating from the comfort of our homes. That to me was one of the, the most interesting discussions that we had, particularly now as we're accessing so much of the content um, through, through digital means. So this report um, can also be found at digitalstage.ca and um, I, like Dessa's report, it, it is also a very dense document, but it, uh, it can be a good catalyst, I think, for, for really interesting conversations in the performing arts about how we can start to adapt for this digital future. And I'll uh, pass it over to Chris now to talk a little bit about the digital reach. Okay, thank you, Amy. Yes, so the digital reach was um, developed in tandem with the CSC and the digital stage. Um, and the idea being, how do we take the learnings from the digital stage around technologies like motion capture, projection mapping, AR, VR, <laughs> Um, audio, video, streaming, and how do we take those technologies, uh, implement them within live performance or within the arts and culture sector, uh, and then help organizations to get their content online. Is someone uh, have their microphone still on? If they can turn it off, that'd be great. Um, so taking those technologies and looking at how to implement those technologies within the arts and culture sector with the purpose of, of increasing the exposure of arts organizations uh, and a digital platform. So the Digital Reach partnered not only with the COC and CERT, um, we're also talking with the Elder Care Center at Sheridan College, uh, the Canadian Music Theatre Project at Sheridan College, and it's looking at different closet. ways would be good for you. We, you 
Can we mute that person? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so the the first phase of the digital stage was to look at, to do an environmental scan, to look at the types of content and the ways in which content is placed online. And so if you go to the, the digital reach page, you can see the environmental scan where we talked about the different social media platforms and, and the different types of content that is placed online. Um, we've talked with a number of different aggregators about putting content online and digital designers about ways in which um, you can create effective content. In those discussions, we realized that a lot of organizations um, and, and all the discussions that there's a, a, the technology deficit was there. And so that then birthed the project on um, video capture uh, technology. So we got together, um, met with a number of different organizations and then created a white paper. Um, that paper is available. And the idea is that here is the technology that you need from you know, a cell phone all the way up to outfitting an entire building with the different digital technology, the cost and the considerations that are needed. So to try to supply organizations at any level with the information, to arm them with the information they need to help them pull together what's required to do an effective um, webcast and or capture. Um, and now the project, uh, and then in the, in the winter months at CERT, we actually then also did a host of, a couple of symposiums around motion capture and projection mapping. And, and you'll see that there's a number of organizations that were invited to that to start to surface these technologies and show them what's available and actually give people access to that information. So we've now moved into phase two of the project, um, which has obviously because of COVID been thoroughly delayed. Um, so, we're now working on a number of projects. One is a content aggregator as a way to help um, increase the searchability uh, of different organizations to make them accessible or any organization to make them more accessible and um, discoverable within uh, searches. Uh, the other project is that, that we're working on is uh, a digital asset management and digital rights management white paper. And the idea is to, to dive into what is required once you capture where do you house that information where does it sit how do you get it out how do you track it so looking at all the different technologies involved with asset management and rights management to provide a real comprehensive study to organizations to help them sort of figure out how they're going to manage their content online and track it and then any or other labor issues that might uh, revolve around those pieces uh, and then the last piece, which I was excited about, which has been thoroughly delayed, is the choreographic workshop, which was uh, with the Canadian Music Theatre Project. And the idea was to take all of these technologies that the digital states surfaced and work with the Music Theatre Project to invite a cross-section of performing arts to Sheridan to actually try these technologies out and figure out how do you incorporate this stuff into a live performance. So working with the different technologies, working with the school and figuring out how do you combine all that together uh, and provide that out and then actually do a demonstration and put it online for people to see and then provide all of the papers around the technologies, how they were used and send that out to the larger organization. So that's currently what's happening. Um, some of it's delayed, but that's where we're at. Did I miss anything, Amy? Nope. No, I'll talk about one of the key findings uh, from, from our research. So what I've heard today and what we uncovered in our, in our research uh, was, was the idea of the digital divide, and that's the uneven access, um, the idea of uneven access and distribution of technologies. Uh, we can see these examples everywhere. Uh, there's socioeconomic factors in, between rural and urban areas, between northern and southern parts of Canada, between large organizations and small to mid-sized organizations, but also between the nonprofit sector and the commercial sector. So even though Chris and I both represent large institutions in this country, our capacity to invest resources in, in technologies, in the technologies that we've explored, is really limited. Um, so that begs the question, what can we do as a sector to build capacity to truly embrace and adopt digital technologies? And I'd like to quote directly from our digital stage report, 
and it said a library system that provides tools and service support on loan could be a step forward to enable smaller, less financially established, or less digitally equipped organizations to participate in the digital transformation of the performing arts. A critical component, component to ensure the success of this approach would be to include a human library element, essentially people on loan to provide assistance to those unfamiliar with the workings of new technology. So uh, one of the things that my, my colleague always says is that if we adopt these technologies early and we integrate them into our practice, we're innovators. But if we wait for them to negatively impact our businesses, then we've been disrupted. So we took that idea and the natural evolution of the digital stage and the knowledge we gained from this project, um, we submitted another application to the Canada Council for the Arts, which we call uh, the Performing Arts Digital Lab or PADL. And we envision this uh, to build an innovation hub where artists and arts organizations, small to large, can access not only the tools, but also the skills that will enable the true adoption of these technologies. Um, we're starting to lay the foundation for this entity later this summer, and we're gonna keep continuing uh, to keep the sector, sector updated on that progress. And really the purpose of Paddle is to de-risk the process so that artists and companies can have a place to experiment without the pressure of live performance or the fear of failure. And uh, if we can get it right, we, we think that Paddle can really have a transformative impact uh, for the sector in our region. And Chris, I'll back to you. Yes, and through all of these discussions and the discussions we've had with the Canada Council and, and with individual groups, there was a realization that, um, or there's discussion about well, what happens after this funding disappears? What do we do? Where do we go? And through these constant conversations between all the different persons in the group, we came up with this uh, idea of an arts and culture technology trust, um, which we lovingly call ACT. Um, and the idea behind this is, can we create uh, a trust that is by the arts and culture sector, for the arts and culture sector, that creates a cross-section between, between education, arts and culture, and industry? And can we bring that together and can we have this, this trust look at the different technologies, surface those technologies and provide the, that information back to the cultural sector? Can it help facilitate the education of people on those technologies? Can it actually help facilitate the use of those technologies? Um, and is there ways in which we can have this trust work to collaborate between organizations um, so that uh, we can figure out how to, you know, not be at cross purposes, but work together using those technologies, using access to all technologies. So shared ticketing platforms, um, access to education, access to technology, and the ability to interface with, with uh, the technology industry. And how would that look? So the, the idea now is to move forward and consult with the larger community to try to figure out how we could create a model uh, and a governance over that model so that it really serves the entire sector, um, not large organizations, but any organization or individual and provide access to that. And we sort of feel that it's the natural extension of paddle as it moves forward or, or how that might exist. We're not sure, but that's the, the sort of future goal that we're looking at and uh, that we're going to propose and see if we can find funding for. So that's it. Thank you, Chris and Amy. Uh, Perry, any questions that we have or comments on chat, the chat box? No, no, no Charles. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone. I mean, this has been really quite amazing. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason, I'm, my video is not working here. I don't know what that is, but we go one more time. Sorry. Um, ah, I'll do it without. I really want to thank the panelists. I've um, been really um, exciting, refreshing, informative. Uh, everyone from uh, you know Kelly Lynn at the outset to uh, Jessa, to uh, Valerie and Anju, to uh, Sean and Victoria, and ending up with Chris and Amy. 
uh, we have a lot of information here, and, um, and hopefully um, those who have been able to stay with us for this time um, uh, have enjoyed, uh, have learned something, and certainly your questions and comments, I think, are going to be helping us as we move forward. Um, so moving forward, uh, on this particular one, um, you know, our hope had been, um, pre-COVID, that we would actually be having Sapamo's gathering. Um, that has not happened. Um, so we thought it best to do something here as a soft launch of our digital report um, and also to bring together the people we've been talking with who've presented today uh, because we wanted to present uh, several other um, projects that are underway um, that seem to have uh, common objectives. Uh, we want to return to this in the fall. Um, the hope would be that we are then able to have personal gatherings um, and we'll see what that story is as the health uh, issues, uh, the pandemic, um, um, where we're at with that. Um, that will give some time, I think, to hear more from others. Um, we'd want to bring obviously the same folks back. I've noticed some other people who are online are doing some amazing work in digital we might add to the agenda, but let's keep our eye on that. Our plan, um, fingers crossed, is to have that kind of a event in um, November, um, but we'll certainly <laughs> The other is, uh, for Di sorry, um, the other is that there's a series of, of these kinds of sessions on different topics that our program manager, Kevin Ormsby, has put together, um, and that was part of the information that went out. So our next session is going to be on uh, June 11th, uh, next Thursday. And that one is going to be looking at how do we navigate precarity. Um, and it's with the voices of small arts organizations, indigenous arts organizations, racialized arts organizations speaking to these issues. Um, and the key point of that is the Sapamo paper, Achieving Equity or Waiting for Godot, um, which points out the ongoing um, income inequities between uh, white artists, artists of color, indigenous artists, uh, artists with, who are uh, deaf or disabled, uh, women artists, and so on. Something we've known about for some time. And to us, the point of if equity means something, then when are we going to get there? How are we going to get there? Uh, and what are the tools? Um, so certainly we'll have um, that coming next week. And if you see the listing of the programs, um, we're having something in July, August, September, October, uh, and so on. Um, again, I want to thank um, the panelists uh, for your presentations. I want to thank those of you who joined us at One-ish and are still here, and those who had to leave early because they had other things, and those who joined us late because they had other things um, that they were doing. These are challenging times, certainly, um, and um, I'm sure we're all feeling zoomed out, <laughs> um, as I guess the expression is, zoom, zoom, zoom. Um, so again, um, thank you very much, everyone, and um, let's stay in touch with each other. I think you can see by the process of today that we were looking at, you know, big picture, community specific, um, the importance of what are the tools, how to enable people to use the tools, how to learn about the tools, and how to connect with each other in a truly transformative way. That means we, as we started off talking about the dish with one spoon, with no knives at the table, uh, it's how we share and how we share equitably. That means recognizing the resources we have and what we need to put on the table so that it can be really true sharing. I'll end on that and um, have a good day, everyone. We'll talk soon, I'm sure. <laughs>